In the early stages of the French Revolution, a sort of classification system started developing to identify the many factions participating and what their general views and aims were. And this classification system was derived from the seating arrangements in the French Estates General. During the sessions, deputies who supported the king, the aristocracy, and the established hierarchy, including the church, sat to the president's right. These individuals were typically conservative in their views and thus came to be known as right-wing. On the other hand, deputies who favored reform, secularization, and other revolutionary changes sat on the left side of the president. These representatives were more radical in their ideas and pushed for more egalitarian social structures. This group came to be known as the left wing. And to this very day, this classification system developed during the French Revolution is still being used as a tool to identify and group different ideas and ideologies into one of two categories, the right and the left. While this system may have been effective and accurate during the time of the French Revolution, the question arises, how much does the right versus left's political spectrum hold up in the modern day, and is it really accurate? Now I myself, just like many people, do use the political spectrum when referring to myself and other people, since it is basically politics 101 at this point and it has been ingrained into our minds. But I started wondering whether the right versus left spectrum really is accurate, considering the many ideologies and ideas that have been developed after the French Revolution. The more I looked into it, the more I realized just how inaccurate the right versus left spectrum actually is, because the entire point of the spectrum is to give a more simple outlook on politics by practically making it black and white, and it is exactly because of this that the spectrum has so many problems. This is what I will be focusing on in today's video, giving my best to expose the many holes that lie in the right versus left spectrum, and perhaps even proposing a better alternative. To start this off, we need to ask ourselves the question, what exactly is the right wing and what is the left wing? And this is probably one of the biggest problems with the spectrum. It doesn't have a universal definition of what it means by right-wing or left-wing. If anything, it is more subjective. Right-wing and left-wing can mean different things depending on who you ask or the political climate of the area. A prominent example is the contrast between American and European politics. In America, the right-wing position more or less means small government and more individual liberties, while the left is more about a stronger government. In Europe, right-wing means nationalist or conservative, while the left means more social progressivism, democracy, and so forth. Ask four different people how they would define the right-wing and left-wing, and you would get four different answers. For the sake of this video, I am going to define the right as social conservatism or even nationalism, because I believe this is what the majority of my viewers would agree on, and this was the original position during the French Revolution. So, the reason why we group so many ideologies into the right or left spectrum is because we believe that there is something, an idea, that unites all of these ideologies into this position. Practically speaking, some sort of common ground all of them can agree on, and as just previously said, this common ground will be social conservatism for the right. So, now we should ask ourselves the question, do all of these ideologies we commonly label as right-wing share this common ground regarding maintaining and supporting social conservative values? The majority of them? Perhaps. But then there are the odd ones out, most notably libertarianism or classical liberalism. Figures like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. These two figures are commonly referred to as right-wing, but considering our definition of right-wing, they do not really align with this idea. 
their primary concern was not to conserve or protect conservative values, rather their primary concerns were more individual rights, smaller government, tax cuts and a more free market economy. And all of these ideas are central to classical liberalism and libertarianism. And this is where the issue arises. What does having a smaller government and less taxes have to do with social conservative values? Despite common belief, libertarianism is not a quote-unquote conservative ideology. Its primary concern is not to protect social conservative values, but instead maximize liberty. And this is not a controversial opinion. Many prominent libertarians also made this distinction very clear. For example, famous libertarian thinker Friedrich Hayek. Hayek argued that libertarians should oppose some basic concepts shared by most conservatives and socialists. He stated, quote, The main point about libertarianism is that it wants to go elsewhere, not to stand still. Or another notable example, Harry Brown, an American politician who was the presidential nominee for the Libertarian Party in 1996 and 2000. Harry would state in regards to libertarianism and conservatism, quote, We should never define libertarian positions in terms coined by liberals or conservatives, nor as some variant of their positions. We are not fiscally conservative and socially liberal. We are libertarians, who believe in individual liberty and personal responsibility on all issues at all times. And this is exactly the problem. Libertarianism may share some common ground with social conservatism on some issues, but ultimately, these two ideas are gonna come into conflict, because some things advocated for by social conservatism are gonna violate the individual rights advocated for by libertarian thought. Take Javier Millet as an example, the recent anarcho-capitalist politician who was elected as president of Argentina. Since he won the election, Javier has been the golden child of the right because of his comments regarding the left. But at the same time, Javier supports the legalization of all drugs, is in favor of naughty work, and also considers open border immigration as wonderful and fabulous. These are all things that are in line with libertarian and classical liberal thought, but someone who identifies as socially conservative will have entirely different opinions regarding these matters. So in the end, I would say that one cannot identify as a social conservative and libertarian at the same time, because both of these ideas will clash against one another inevitably. So, if we define the right as social conservative, then libertarians are not compatible with it, because their main focus is not to preserve tradition and these values, but rather, as mentioned before, maximizing liberty. And this issue does not disappear if we change the definition of what right-wing is. If we define it as more individual rights and freedom, then all the other ideologies which are opposed to libertarian thought will also not be compatible. And the last thing we need is for traditional Catholicism to be considered left-wing. When it comes down to it in the end, libertarians will always be ready to choose their individual rights and personal responsibility over conservative values when they inevitably come into conflict just like Harry Brown stated. And for this reason, it does not make sense to put libertarianism in the same category with these other ideologies. If there is one thing that is almost certain, whether you are left-wing or right-wing, is that you are strongly opposed to the other wing and their ideals. The left is the natural enemy of the right and vice versa, oil and water. But what if, theoretically, an ideology and idea emerged that combines ideas from both the right as well as the left? Where would it then stand on the political spectrum? And this problem became very evident with the rise of a brand new ideology in the early 20th century, fascism. 
Fascism has always been a really fascinating idea, because contrary to what the modern left or the libertarian right may say, fascism does not belong to either category. It combines some elements from both the right as well as the left. And this, in the end, led to the fact that fascism and fascists had a bone to pick with with both sides. And this issue was in the end noticed, so a solution was drafted. There would be two right-wing versus left-wing spectrums, one for social views and the other for economic views. On the social we have conservatism and progressivism, and on the economic we have capitalism and socialism. And this would, in the end, lead to the creation of the infamous political compass. So fascism was then explained as socially conservative and economically socialist. Problem solved, right? Well, not exactly. While the addition of the economic spectrum was more helpful, many problems were still left unresolved, especially when you realize that fascism does not consider itself socially conservative or reactionary. Yeah, this may surprise some of you, but despite what the mainstream may tell you, fascism was never a conservative or reactionary ideology. Fascism has always been revolutionary. It never sought to preserve the status quo or go back to something. It always aimed to create a new fascist society and man. Let us take the book The Origins and Doctrine of Fascism by Giovanni Gentile, who is considered the mastermind behind the fascist ideology. In this book, there is a discussion about the nature of fascism in relation to conservative and reactionary politics. Specifically, he described the fascist revolution as quote-unquote conservative in the sense that it seeks to preserve the revolutionary elements of Italy's modern political and economic developments. However, this conservation is not aimed at maintaining the status quo, but rather at building upon these developments to create something new. Quote, that Italy that we all carry in our hearts, and which forms in fact the substance of our being and of our character, if we watch it intensely today, with a gaze made more acute by our desire for a more elevated and powerful national life, with a passion that we cherish within ourselves after the agony of defeat and the pride of victory in the Great War, that Italy presents itself to us in two manifestly different forms. We see two Italies before us, one old and the other new. There is the Italy of the ages which is our glory, but which is also our sad legacy, heavy on our shoulders and a burden to our spirits. It is a legacy which we must canonly admit is a disgrace, of which we would be free, for which we must make amends. Gentile's interpretation of fascism implies that it draws from the past, not to return to it, but to use it as a foundation for future progress. This stance positions fascism as a movement that looks to history and tradition, not for the sake of mere preservation or a return to a previous state, but as a means to construct a new, unified and powerful national identity and country. Another example is Benito Mussolini. In several of his speeches, he talks about the reactionary ideology much the same way as communists do, something that needs to be annihilated. And in the doctrine of fascism, Mussolini would state, quote, The fascist state is, however, a unique and original creation. It is not reactionary, but revolutionary, for it anticipates the solution of certain universal problems which have been raised elsewhere, in the political field by splitting up of parties, the usurpation of power by parliaments, the responsibility of assemblies. As Gentile stated, while fascism does draw from the past, it does not want to preserve or return to it, but use it more like a blueprint for the creation of an entirely new society. So calling fascism socially conservative is also completely wrong. Fascism is opposed to reactionary ideology much in the same way as communism is. 
And ironically, the political spectrum's failure to properly address and integrate ideologies such as fascism into one of its positions led to the creation of the third position, a position that is beyond both the left and the right, and for ideologies that do not identify with any of the two wings. And even non-fascist ideologies started popping up in the third position. Of course, third positionism is not without its own problems. The conflict between the fascist third position and the non-fascist third position is very much evident. But still, the fact that a split happened in a spectrum that led towards the creation of a new position is evident that maybe politics are not as black and white as they may seem, and undoubtedly, it presents itself as the biggest hole in the political spectrum. And do not even get me started on this rabbit hole. The main issue with the political spectrum is that it tries to simplify and make politics easier to understand, but by trying that, you would be taking away all the nuance and instead painting political positions as either black or white, and as shown with the emergence of fascism and other third positionist ideologies, this whole system will start falling apart when actual more complicated political ideas emerge. The truth is that politics are just so much more complicated than just simply dividing it into right-wing versus left-wing, and while again, the political spectrum tries to simplify politics and make it more understandable, by doing so you are just skewing the truth in favor of something more easily digestible. One of the biggest problems today we are facing is the fact that people would much rather hear a simple lie than a complicated truth. But hypothetically speaking, could there be a spectrum that would be much more accurate than right-wing versus left-wing? After spending some time thinking about this, I believe I may have come up with something a little more accurate. Keep in mind that I don't think my proposed alternative is flawless, again I already stated that politics are much more complicated than just grouping it into two categories, but I believe it to be the most accurate. The real divide shouldn't be right-wing or left-wing, but rather individualism versus collectivism. Individualism being the social theory that rights should be primarily focused on the individual and giving the individual more power, while collectivism is the social theory that favors giving a group, like the state, more power over the individual. And this is an issue almost every political ideology is gonna take a stance on. Don't get confused, by collectivism I am not talking about the communist policy of collectivization, which is the organizing of a country's production and industry into government ownership, but rather the idea that the group is more important than the individual. Let's put this on a spectrum. On one side we have collectivism, and on the other we have individualism. All ideologies have a stance on this matter, whether that will be individualist or collectivist, but the one thing they disagree on is how far they are willing to go. On the far end of collectivism we would have communism, which believes that the state is absolute and everything, from the means of production all the way to farms should be under state control, and the individual has extremely little, if any, chance of fighting back against the state when it wrongs them somehow. In essence, the state is absolute in every way. Then we would have fascism. While it also believes in a totalitarian state, it is more lenient compared to communism and allows for private property, although under strict state supervision or partial control, and the individual may have some leverage to fight back for their rights. But in essence, you get the point. The further away from the far end of collectivism you go, the amount of individual rights grow and are stronger. Until we reach the opposite side of the spectrum where the individual is more powerful compared to the state. This could encompass many liberal ideologies, like those more milder ones that believe the state should still play a role in society but not too much, to those like libertarianism trying to maximize liberty and individual rights to the fullest extent, until reaching the far end of the individualist spectrum, which could encompass many forms of anarchism. 
But you understand, collectivism is more power to the state than the individual, while individualism is more power to the individual than the state. Is this spectrum completely flawless? Of course not. But it is much more accurate than the right-wing versus left-wing spectrum because, number one, individualism and collectivism already have universally agreed upon definitions, so a person can't define these terms in their own way, and number two, the vast majority of ideologies have a stance on this matter. They are either more collectivist or individualist, or something in between. I believe that the political spectrum may have been a lot more effective during the times of the French Revolution and a few years after it, but as society progressed, as politics started getting more complicated and new philosophies and ideologies started getting developed, the harder it was for the spectrum to keep up, and the emergence of ideologies like fascism was the straw that broke the camel's back, because it was completely unable to explain and integrate the phenomena into its classification system. But it is also because of that that this phenomena started getting weaponized by both sides of the spectrum as a means to try and discredit the other. The best example I can give is the eternal debate on whether National Socialism is right-wing or left-wing, capitalist or socialist. Ever since the end of the Second World War, both the right and the left kept kicking the Nazi ball into the other's field as a means to have a moral condemnation against them. You know, if Hitler is in your quadrant, that must mean you must align with Hitler more than me, and that means you are a bad person, and your ideology is closest to Hitler. And this ball kicking is still going on to this day, with neither side even attempting to comprehend the idea that maybe National Socialism is neither left-wing nor right-wing. However, the right-wing versus left-wing spectrum has been ingrained in politics for a very long time, and it is unlikely that we are gonna see it getting rid of, especially since simplifying politics to just black and white is essential and a useful tool for many establishment and mainstream political parties, and hell, even I myself am gonna continue using it to some extent. But it is essential to realize that there is a lot of nuance in politics. It is much more complicated than just putting every ideology on earth into one or two categories. And the first step towards properly understanding the nature of politics is to realize this, and to always seek out the complicated truth, rather than a simple lie.